Yeah, it looks like it. It's what they've done. Like, it's cool to see a piece of yeah. the stuff that they're working on and their volunteers. And three, I think we've got the best three candidates we've ever had on the, on the North Shore as well. Uh, diverse. Uh, Maddie's a PhD. Lowell's an engineer. With a business degree. I mean, they're just standing individuals in the community and they're going to be a great asset to government should we be successful. Hi, I'm Richard Zussman. I am the CBC's Provincial Affairs Reporter. I am here today in North Vancouver with NDP leader John Horgan. Thank you for joining us on our Facebook Live. John will be here with me for the next half an hour or so, and we will take all the questions that you have. So please send them in the comments below. We're also on Periscope and YouTube, so thank you for joining us there as well. Uh, and if you missed our interview yesterday with Andrew Weaver, you can still find it on the CBC Vancouver Facebook page, the Green Party leader. And tomorrow I will be doing a Facebook Live. At some point tomorrow, we still haven't determined the time, with BC Liberal leader Christy Clark. But today the focus is John Horgan, the NDP leader. John, thanks for doing this. Good to be here. Uh, so let's talk. We have some questions, and I'll wait till they start coming in uh, to the system. But we have some that people have been sending throughout sure. the campaign. But I have a few of my own first. And how do you think, first off, people perceive you? Well, I've been uh, crisscrossing the province for the past three years as leader of the BC NDP, talking to people about the issues that are important to them, whether they live in in the north, in the Caribou, in the Kootenays or Vancouver Island, or here in the Lower Mainland. And what I've learned from that is that people are yearning for a government that works for them. What I've been hearing is that people feel frustrated, that the services that they count on are not there for them when they need them. Health care, public education, and uh, the affordability issue. It's critically important here in the Lower Mainland on the housing front, but there's a whole host of other issues that are costing people more medical services premiums, hydro rates, ICBC rates. So those list of affordability challenges are things that I've been focusing on in this election campaign. And so when people now look at John Horgan and the BCNDP, I'd like them to think, here's someone who's going to have their back, someone's going to be working for them. Yep, so everyone knows it's watching on YouTube, Periscope, Facebook. We'll be taking your questions. We're here at Bowen Ma's campaign headquarters in North Vancouver, Lonsdale, so you can see some volunteers busily working back there. and. You know, you mentioned a number of issues, but but personally, what words do you think? Uh, what would what words do you use to describe yourself? Uh, compassionate, passionate, uh, caring. These are the things that my wife says about me. I think if I could start <laughs> with that, uh, I don't like to talk about myself because although I am the leader of the BC NDP, this campaign has been about people. That's why I got involved in public life. That's why I ran for office for the first time. That's why I wanted to lead a political party and lead a government that focused on people. So. That's been my focus since for as long as I can remember, and that's why I'm doing this today. You mentioned MSP. I think yeah. one question people have is how is it going to be paid for? There's been some confusion about whether it will be rolled into the income tax system, whether uh, you will have this panel that will make a decision, yeah. and to what decision, and how long it will take to make a decision, and is there no way that you'll pay it in four years? Can you explain to me how MSP will be paid for uh, under an NDP government, if that's the case. Sure. Uh, this is uh, something that's been part and parcel of the collection of taxes in British Columbia for a long time. We're already collecting the tax. The problem is it's not fair. If you make $40,000 a year, you make $400,000 a year, you pay the same amount of MSP. Every other province in Canada has figured out a way to raise revenues to meet the needs of the community, the services that we all depend on, without having a flat regressive tax called medical services premiums. It's a tax, it's a tax, it's a tax. Our plan is to get rid of it over the course of a four-year term. That means making sure that we're protecting low and middle income families and providing the services that people depend on and making sure that our health care system continues to grow and meet the needs of, a, of an aging uh, society. And how you do that is you talk to people about how you collect that tax, how you collect those revenues. Uh, every other province in the country has done it. We're going to cut the MSP premiums in half. January 1st of next year, and we're going to build a plan over the three years left in the NDP mandate to eliminate it altogether. How are we going to do that? We're going to ask experts, employers, employees, those within the Ministry of Finance who already collect the tax, how can we make this fairer and distribute the cost over a, a larger number of people protecting low and middle income families? But those that pay more, those that make more will likely have to pay more in the system. The, the, I don't want to prejudge what the panel will come up with. But the, the chances are that what, what I'm going to ask them to do is say, every other province in the country does this differently. Let's take a look at it, bring back recommendations, we'll implement that, and we'll do away with an unfair tax. 
That's the message for people at home. You're paying more now because of the way this is distributed. $400,000 a year, $40,000 a year, the same cost. That's not fair. It's the foundation of our progressive tax system in Canada, been there for as long as I can remember and long, long before I was born. And BC is the only province in the country that does it this way. I want to change that. Thank you for joining us here on Facebook Live, also on Periscope and YouTube. Uh, Richard Zussman, uh, the CBC Legislative Reporter, alongside NDP leader John Horgan. We have about 25 minutes left, so please start bringing in your questions. We're going to get to those now. Uh, we will get to as many questions as possible. I'll also hit on some of the questions that have been sent to us in advance. So I'm going to start with one that was sent in through Facebook from David Jones. He wants to know, uh, do you want to stop the Kinder Morgan pipeline altogether and lose all the jobs? Uh, that could come with it, or do you have an alternative plan uh, for job creation? Well, good question. Thank you for that. Uh, I believe that a seven-fold increase in tanker traffic into our large metropolitan center does not make sense. It does, might have made sense in the 1950s. It doesn't make sense today. My concern is protecting and defending our coast. That's the obligation of the leader of a government in British Columbia, and that's what I'll be focused on. In terms of creating jobs, construction jobs, our platform calls for an aggressive development of transit and transportation, not just in the Lower Mainland, but right across BC, building schools, building hospitals. In Surrey, right now, today, 7,000 kids are learning in portable classrooms because the government has not kept pace with the growth in our fast-growing areas. I want to change that. Putting people to work, 96,000 jobs from a $10 billion capital plan that's fully costed in our platform that we tabled just at the start of the election campaign. I believe we can create lots of construction jobs, building the infrastructure that British Columbians need, rather than focusing on building a pipeline that will put our coast at risk. Tom Day, also on Facebook, wants to know, how will you ensure that developers build more properties for renters? Yeah. Our plan, again, tabled just, before the just after the election started, has 114,000 new units built over a 10-year period. That's social housing or not-for-profit housing rent purpose built housing, co-op housing, and also working with developers and communities to build the market-based housing that we need for those who want to get into the housing market on a purchase level. But the challenges we have in terms of affordability here in the Lower Mainland particularly, also on the South Island in the interior, where people are now moving uh, with their revenue, with their, with their capital to buy more homes. People are finding other places to live because they can't afford to live here in the Lower Mainland. We want to make sure that we're bringing down costs by bringing on more supply. That means helping renters find a place to live, and part of that is a, a renter's rebate. Part of our campaign plan is to give $400 to all renters in British Columbia to make sure that they can stretch their, their pay packet a little bit further each month. Would you require municipalities to build density on expansions for public transit? We're going to talk about that. I've been working with representatives of the Mayor's Council for the past number of months encouraging more transportation and transit development here in the Lower Mainland. We are absolutely supportive of the Mayor's 10-year plan, which will put people to work, 43,000 people according to the, the Mayor's plan, and, and building an, a transportation and transit network that works for everybody. And when you put that transit and transportation in place, that's an opportunity for municipalities to make the land use choices that will see more density along those transit and transportation corridors. Until that's built, Richard, I think communities are saying, well, wait a second, is this just going to mean more cars and more congestion, or are we going to be able to move people freely around as we build up rather than sprawl out? And I, I'm confident working with mayors rather than pointing fingers at mayors will get a better result. You talk a lot about consultation and panels. You're the one, though, that British Columbians are deciding to vote for to be yeah. premier, to make those decisions. Shouldn't British Columbians have a better sense about how you feel on these issues, about what you would do, rather than let the mayors tell you what to do? Well, listen, I come from Vancouver Island, and I defer to the people who are making the tough choices here in the Lower Mainland. Mayors and councils in, in the most populous area in British Columbia have been grappling with where's the place to start? What do we do first? The B.C. Liberal approach is to put a 10-lane bridge that only one mayor in the entire region thinks is a good idea, spending almost $4 billion on that infrastructure when no one wants it. That doesn't make any sense. That's imposing your will on community. I believe people want leadership that works with everybody to get results that everybody can live with. That's my approach to life, that's my approach to politics, and that will be my approach to government. 
I don't think people at home watching today want me to wave a magic wand and dictate to them what's in their best interest. They want me to work with people to make sure we get good results. And I think the mayors have worked very, very hard on a 10-year plan. They've made trade-offs. People in Maple Ridge want more buses. People in, in Richmond want to make sure we address the, the Massey Tunnel. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the table, and the mayors have come together with a plan. What they need is a partner in Victoria, not, a, not an enemy. All right, so let's get to more of these questions for people. Keep sending them into Facebook. Uh, Luis Michelle asks on Facebook, could you explain the three phases of the $10 a day daycare plan and when and what is the first phase? Sure. Well, phase one is to, to collect together all of the pockets of cash that are spent, that is spent currently on child care within the provincial budget. There's money in social development, there's money in education, there's money in the Ministry of Children and Family Development. We want to focus that in one place so that we're creating new spaces. In the first phase, 22,000 new child care spaces, focusing initially in phase one on infant and toddler care. The toughest care to find in the market today from birth to age three, that's phase one. Phase two will focus on expanding that from, grade, uh, from age three to kindergarten. And then phase three is finally over the 10 year period, making a comprehensive plan for child care for all British Columbians. But right off the bat, we want to make sure that people making less than $40,000 a year are not burdened by paying more for child care. It's some, in some communities in the lower mainland and right across BC, it costs more to get your child from birth to kindergarten than it does to get them a university degree. That makes no sense to me and it doesn't make any sense to the economy. Child care is good for kids, it's good for families, and it's good for the economy because it allows people to be more productive. If you're not worried about the patchwork child care plan you've got tacked to your fridge right now, if you can have confidence that there's affordable, accessible, safe, licensed child care for your kids, you're going to be more productive in the workplace. That's good for the economy. But what do you say to people, including the BC Liberal leader, that it will be when people are getting driver's licenses. That's just not true. That's just not true. So what is not true about that? Because this plan takes a long time to unfold. So if you it, have it's a child a, It's now, a 10-year plan, but it starts in year one. And by year three, there will be 22,000 new spaces by year, by year all, five, 66,000. Of all, for, of That's all right. incomes at that point. That's right. Yeah. All right. So let's get to Christian Tatanetsky's Just before we move off on this, yeah, if, Christy, sure. if Christy Clark had spent more time focused on addressing the challenges families face, she wouldn't be so glib in her responses. This is a crisis for families. It's a crisis for people right across British Columbia. Since I was elected in my community in Lankford, one of the fastest growing areas certainly in British Columbia, but absolutely on Vancouver Island, young families are moving in and they can't find childcare. That burdens them. They can't afford to live in unaffordable circumstances. They can't get back into the workplace. It's good for everybody. And why the Liberals have ignored this strikes me is that they're focused on the people that are funding their campaigns rather than ordinary people. So we have about 15 minutes or so, a little bit longer, with NDP leader John Horgan. I'm Richard Zussman, Provincial Affairs Reporter for the CBC. Please send in your questions, and I'll get to one now that was sent in through Facebook. Uh, you're also watching on Periscope and YouTube, so thank you for joining us there. And uh, if you pick up the social media channels, you can jump around a little bit. Christian Tadanetti wants to know, what do you think of that, quote, ugly liberal troll truck, end quote, following <laughs> the NDP bus during the campaign? I notice we haven't seen it in a while, but do you promise never to do something like that? Yeah, diminishing returns for them, I guess. Yeah, no, that, that seemed uh, childish, was generous, I think, to say. Uh, I, I couldn't get over it. And when I saw one of the senior people in, in Christy Clark's office in Victoria, apparently on holidays, uh, in the in the uh, passenger seat, driving around, following us to uh, events with children. We're, we're doing announcements about playgrounds, and there's this uh, the, the troll truck following us around. It was juvenile, and I think people re responded just as they should. And liberals aren't doing it anymore because it looks stupid on them. It is important to note, though, that staffers from both the NDP sure, and the yeah. liberals are on leave. They're not called vacations, yep. John. They're working hard okay. for their campaigns. Maybe not for you, but you have staff yeah, that are enough. also on your campaign. So, yeah. Miles Smiley on CBC Victoria's Facebook page wants to know, what are your plans in terms of BC's role around uh, the legalization of uh, marijuana? Good question. And something that I've been focused on since uh, Justin Trudeau uh, campaigned on legalization, legaliza legalizing marijuana. First thing I did after the BC, pardon me, the federal Liberals were elected in Ottawa was send two of my senior people, Mike Farnworth, who's responsible for public safety, in the official opposition and Carol James responsible for finance. I sent them to Washington and Oregon to talk to policymakers there about what were the challenges that they faced when they decriminalized and legalized marijuana 
How did they distribute it? What was the price point that made sure that the black market and the crime element didn't exist? And what did they do to make sure they were protecting kids and getting the revenue that we all hope for? And we learned a great deal from that trip. And I think we're in a good place now, should we be successful on May 9th, to put in place a regulatory regime to make sure that we can implement by, uh, I think it's July of 2018, if we follow the federal uh, guidelines. But the, a couple of options. We've talked to people that work in uh, existing dispensaries, in the distribution of liquor, whether it be through public stores or private stores, as well as uh, pharmacies, big, big pharmacies that, that people might be more comfortable getting their medicinal cannabinoids from. And I think that range of options is there. We want to talk to the public about this, consult with people to see how, they're, how comfortable they are with these various methods of distribution. But a caution I would make to those that are watching at home, we've always thought, myself included, that if only we legalize marijuana, there would be a windfall of revenues to government. And what other jurisdictions are finding out is that if you price the, the product, whether for medicinal or recreational use, if we price it too high, that just keeps the black market going. You're still going to have a criminal element that's going to undercut the public sources. So we have to manage that carefully and make sure that we're protecting kids, protecting communities, and making sure that those who want to access this product are able to do so in a safe and fair and cost-effective way. Vicki Worsley said this in on Facebook, uh, and she wants to know what are you going to do about ICBC rates? Well, first of all, I, I give full credit to uh, one of our, your colleagues in the press gallery who broke a story last fall that the B.C. Liberals are planning a 42% increase in ICBC rates after the election. They didn't want to talk about it before the election. Uh, one of the reporters that you work with, Richard, got access to this information, and the Liberals were scrambling to try and cover this up. But the challenges in our Crown corporations, particularly ICBC, are quite severe. We've seen significant increases in costs, over the past number of years with more to come. My commitment in this election campaign is to ensure that this 42% increase does not happen. But until we get in and take a look at just what they're up to, it'll be difficult for me to answer that, that, that question. What we do need to do is make sure that the Utilities Commission, who are th there to protect ratepayers and pol uh, hydro and policyholders at ICBC, are getting access to this information. When I make a, a freedom information request for that information, I get back blank pages, and I think that's what the CBC gets but, as well. But it will be cheaper. Uh, that's you, you that absolutely that our will plan. Be cheaper that, for basic insurance. Rate that that is our plan. We're going to do everything we can to drive down those increases. Firstly, the, how the do BC. You to do that? Well, the BC Liberals have been using our Crown corporations as cash cows. They've been they've been using them as instant teller machines, calling on the Crowns Hydro and ICBC to put revenue back into, into the provincial treasury, even if they're not profitable. It's most uh, damaging at BC Hydro, but they're doing the same thing at ICBC. We need to get in there, fix the mess, and make sure we're protecting the people. These public utilities and public insurance companies were designed for, protect the public, not to gouge them and not to pad the budgets for the Minister of Finance. You say uh, you're a supporter of ride sharing. Yes. You haven't yet told British Columbians how and when, do you have a timeline for when you'd like to see ride sharing on the roads? Yeah, Th this is, and the way you characterize the question, Richard, I want to spin that around a bit. Sure. It's not about me, okay. it's about the public. And the public knows that ride sharing is coming, as do I. I called on the Liberals two years ago to sit down with me and other members of the legislature. Let's open up some committee rooms. Let's talk about this. What we, can we do to make sure we're protecting the traveling public, we're protecting the existing industry, and we're welcoming in these new entrants? Nothing. Crickets. I wrote them again a year ago. Why don't we sit down and talk about this? Nothing. Crickets. And then, of course, 16 days before the election, the B.C. Liberals said, here's our plan. Well, I'm not going to be bound by their decisions. They did that behind closed doors. They didn't do that in, cons in consultation with existing providers. They didn't they tell did. us what. No, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. You go and talk to the taxi but industry. Over a year they spent talking to. If behind closed doors, Richard, we have a legislature that's there and designed so the public can have input. The public can see in a transparent way what government is doing. And for 16 years, the BC Liberals have been doing stuff behind closed doors. The public at home, the people are watching today, are concerned that the only decisions Christy Clark makes are for the donors that provide her campaign resources. I want to make decisions for the public. I want to make sure that they know why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Ride sharing is coming. We're going to work as fast as we can. I'm not going to be bound to, to Christy Clark's agenda. I'm going to create an agenda for me and the people of BC. Please uh, send in your questions again. Richard Zussman, Provincial Affairs Reporter for the CBC, NDP Leader John Horgan. You're watching us on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Please send in your questions. We have about a little bit more than 10 minutes left here. And, uh,
Lots of questions to get to. So Ryan McIntyre from Facebook has one here. How will you attract more doctors to BC to resolve the shortage? Yeah. Family doctors, I'm sure, is what he means here, and in what timeline? Yeah, big challenge. Uh, the BC Liberals at the last election promised a GP for me, was the name of their program. They said they were going to have doctors for every British Columbian who wanted one. Well, here we are, 200,000 British Columbians still seeking a family doctor. According to the Minister of Health, 700,000 British Columbians don't have access to a doctor. Most of them have stopped looking. We have a walk-in clinic system that's failing. We need to make sure we address that. And what we proposed in this campaign is to create urgent care centers, a stopgap between the walk-in clinics and the clogged emergency rooms so that people can access nurse practitioners, uh, therapists, counselors, uh, re registered nurses, and doctors to make sure they're getting the care they need from the care provider that's required. You don't always have to see a doctor to get health care, but it's absolutely critical that we bring in more doctors. So the urgent care center is a starting point as we try and recruit and retain more health care professionals in British Columbia. We need to train more and we need to recruit more. And one issue that I've discovered working here in the North Shore is we need to make sure that we're accelerating our ability to recognize foreign credentials, not just in medicine, but in a whole range of other professional activities. We have a whole number of people that have come to British Columbia to make a better life for themselves that have practical uh, credentials from other jurisdictions and we don't recognize them fast enough. Not just in healthcare, but right across the board. I want to focus on that as well. David Walker on Facebook wants to know uh, what's happened uh, to an inquiry on the firing of healthcare workers. So we've seen this report from the Ombudsperson. Would you yeah. launch a, a public independent inquiry following what we've seen from Jay Chalk? Um, and, and what would that look to you? Well, this is a, a tragedy that's been five years in the making, and I think it speaks and goes right to the heart of the, the lack of understanding the B.C. Liberals have of the importance of making sure we're, we're working for everybody. These, the issue is the firing of health care workers, health care, pardon me, uh, health care researchers, uh, that we're working diligently uh, using data to come up with best outcomes for, for citizens in British Columbia. These were hardworking scientists looking at data and spreadsheets, not uh, nefarious in any way. They were fired, they were smeared. One individual feeling that his life had, had, had come to an end, he was just starting his PhD program, took his own life. And, and that tragedy, I think, has highlighted the insensitivity of Christy Clark and the BC Liberals on this question. I'm not convinced that more examination of this is in the public interest. I think the public knows enough right now to say, firstly, the BC Liberals knew early on, after the firings, that they'd made an error. And they covered it up for eight months before the sister of Rod McIsaac came to the legislature to appeal to the government to get to the bottom of this. And that was three years ago. And it took that length of time for us to get the answers we got from Mr. Chalk. I think he did a comprehensive review. I think there's more work to be done in terms of redress for those individuals. But at the end of the day, the message that comes out of this is we need to make sure that government is not heavy-handed with its employees and we recognize that if you're going to encourage people to come and do health research in British Columbia, that wasn't the way to do it. We want to make sure that BC is a hub for intellectual activity and it's really hard after what those individuals went through to encourage uh, young professionals to come to British Columbia and assist with medical research when this is the way they're treated. All right, so we have uh, five, six, seven minutes left here. So if you have more questions, please send them in. Thank you so much to those who already have and are joining us on YouTube and Periscope as well as Facebook. Uh, Lindsay Borschneck wants to know, what's your response to the CBC's fact check that we've been doing, doing through the campaign on the NDP plan to build 114,000 housing units. I'll just read a quote from that story Good. for you. They call it incredibly, I know he's a busy man so yeah. he doesn't have a chance to read everything. So they call the plan incredibly unrealistic. Anne McMullen from the Urban Development Institute and I'll read the quote. Quote, the cost of that is staggering. It's billions of dollars over the number of years. Where's that money going to come from? It might sound good, but when you when you scratch below the surface, I don't know how realistic it is. So can you explain to people sure. whether it is realistic to build the 114,000 homes over 10 years? Uh, I think if Ms. McMullen had looked closely at the plan, she would have understood that this is not uh, publicly funded, completely publicly funded housing. This is in partnership, in partnership with the private sector, with the development community, so that we're building the supply that we need to meet the demand. 
These are pretty basic economic principles. The challenge we have in the Lower Mainland with respect to housing has been driven largely by speculation. And those that are speculating in the marketplace to try and make quick profits are the ones that have driven up the benchmark price for housing here between 2014 and 2016 went up $600,000. That's just not sustainable. We're putting forward a plan to build more housing, not just not, not government housing, but government or housing for the people of British Columbia in partnership with uh, representatives from the development community. We've been in consultation with them. We talked earlier on about how we're going to make sure that the land use decisions about density and, and where we build take place. We want to bring on Crown land, for example. The province has got lots to bring to the table that's not cash. We bring on land to assist developers to meet their objectives for their businesses and also provide the housing that people need. How would you treat developers who have donated a lot of money to the BC Liberals? Uh, and you've mentioned many times you don't believe that should be part of it. Will yeah. these developers be treated any differently? Well, I think the good news for the development community is that one of the first orders of business of an NDP government is to get big money out of politics. So the rubber chicken circuit has come to an end for them. They don't have to endure dry speeches and eat bad dinners and give big piles of money to the government. They can go about their business, they can ask for meetings, they can have meetings in open where everyone understands what's going on. They don't have to have secret dinners with the Premier. They can make decisions for their businesses in the interest of, of their profitability and also in the interest of public development. I believe if we get big money out of politics, I can work with anybody. I can work with developers. I, Richard, I often say that I come from a working class background. I'm as comfortable in a lunchroom as I am in a boardroom. I think that it's time that there was a premier that can talk to everybody, working people, investors, and the environmental community to build the British Columbia that we all want. It's about balance. That's what I've been focused on my entire life, and I think it's time that the government did that too. Alex Sager wants to know, what is your relationship with the United Steelworkers Union while we're on the topic of donations? Sure. Well, I've said to, uh, to people that work in the forest industry, the pe people that work in the mining sector in British Columbia, that I've got their backs. In forestry, we've got 30,000 fewer people working than we did when the Liberals came to power. It's little wonder that the representatives of forest workers want to support a government that wants to work for them. I've made no promises to anyone other than I'm going to work as hard as I can to grow the economy to work for everybody. And again, as I say to the development community, I say to the steel workers, no more rubber chickens, no more contributions. Individuals should be at the center of our politics. That's what we've been saying for the past decade. We've tabled legislation six times and the Liberals have said no. They've said no because they like it this way. They like working for the top 2%. The people at the top have had their premier. It's time that you had one working for you. But people do have questions about you know, how your senior staff are paid for by this union. The, the, say, look, this is, the, this is the Liberal double standard. I mean, they've been collecting millions and millions of dollars. Their senior staff are paid for by the development community we just talked about, Which by the party, forest company. staff. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. paid for from contributions from the, the big donors that are funding the BC Liberal Party. There is no difference. The difference is, I want to stop it. They don't. Joe Soulier wants to know, and, and this may be a municipal question, but you may get your finger into this one. What will you and your party do to rejuvenate our, I, I'm assuming Metro Vancouver, once main entertainment hubs, such as Granville, West 4th, Broadway, I'll add Robson to it. Way too many storefronts are boarded up, making them look like a ghost town. Yeah. Well, I have to say I played the Commodore uh, <laughs> last week and I did my best to, to increase the entertainment district by showing up there with a thousand of my friends. But yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm a, a strong supporter of the arts. I, I believe that uh, investment in making sure that we have a vibrant arts community is good for everybody. It creates more economic activity and it allows people to, to celebrate their talents. I'm a passionate believer in that. Uh, my colleague Spencer Chandra Herbert has been our point person on this and there's nobody in, in the legislature that works harder than him at promoting uh, music, uh, arts and other cultural industries and I believe that those areas that were reflected in the question have been uh, beginning to decline and we want to work with municipalities to make sure we can revive that. And hey. investing in the arts is a way do that. Education, a big issue. You Huge. brought it up in the debate. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian Zane wants to know through Facebook, how much more money are you proposing for education? Well, we have currently a court-imposed solution. The Supreme Court of Canada smacked down 15 years of aggression from the BC Liberals against kids and families and teachers in our education system. We've only begun to scratch the surface, and it's important uh, for Sebastian and others watching at home to understand that the crisis that we're talking about in public education, the underfunding for a decade and a half, 
falls squarely at the feet of Christy Clark. She was the Minister of Education when this all started, and she's been Premier for the past five years. We have a big hole to get out of because of a court decision, a court decision that was brought against a government that was so callous and so arrogant, they thought they could do anything. It's a big hole to get out of, and we're going to work as hard as I can, to, hard as we can, to make sure we're providing the services our kids deserve, so that we can get quality education for all British Columbians. So we have a few more. We're, we're running out of time here. John's a very busy man. He's got to get back on with the tour today. Uh, they're going across Metro Vancouver again today, and uh, with six days left, it's important to get out, obviously, to see as many people as possible. But people have been very patient on Facebook. We really appreciate the question. So I'll hit two more topics sure. before I let you go. Yeah. Um, Elise Velasquez Cote from Facebook wants to know, uh, do you support some sort of electoral reform? Oh, absolutely. Elise, thank you for the question. Uh, I, uh, I support uh, democratic reforms, not just uh, in terms of how we select people, but how we operate our, our democratic institutions, uh, our, our parliament and our legislature. That goes back to the, the question about ride sharing. Great opportunity to have a discourse and a dialogue in our legislature so the public can view it. We have this enormous amount of infrastructure there. You see it every day, Richard. We've got cameras. We've got, we, can, we can live stream this information as we're doing today. Why in the world wouldn't our institutions do that? In terms of electing people, though, I am committed to making sure that within the first two years of an NDP government, we put forward uh, to the public in a referendum a mixed member proportionality or some form of proportional representation so that we don't have to have an electoral system where you're voting uh, when less than 50% of the votes form the government. I believe that electoral reforms time has come. I thought the federal government agreed with that. Mr. Trudeau has moved away from it. I'm committed to it. I invite you to go to uh, Fair Vote Canada and take a look at the interview I did there. I can, that's a longer, a half an hour worth of answers rather than 30 seconds. But I'm committed to it. But it will only pass if there's a referendum of voters that 50% uh, plus one is that will be the threshold. And if that happens, the next election will be under a different system than the one we have today. Because Keith Poor on Twitter asks that question. London, Ontario just changed their voting system to ranked ballots. Yeah. Would you allow municipalities to change theirs? Well, again, uh, if, if they get the support of the, uh, I, I believe if you're going to change an electoral system, you have to have the support of the electors. It shouldn't just be imposed from the top down. I studied in Australia where they have a ranking ballot system as well, and they have a, a host of different voting uh, practices in different states or the provinces that we have here. They call them states. So there's not, a, there's not one answer to this challenge, but there needs to be one answer for provincial elections in British Columbia, and I'm committed to that. If municipalities want to bring forward ideas around ward systems or other, other ways to proceed, if they can get support of the majority of their voters, I don't have a problem with that at all. A lot has been made uh, about the role of the Green Party and this idea of vote splitting. Uh, I have a question here from Andrew Wilson. If you lose the election, would you consider an alliance or coalition with the BC Greens? I'm focused on winning the election on May 9th so that we can, uh, I don't believe we can risk four more years of Christy Clark. That is my absolute uh, drive to, to the next six days. I believe we can do better. I believe that 16 years of cynicism and neglect of the services we need is too long and four more years is just not acceptable to me. I appeal to all voters to look at the, the candidates they have before them and vote for a government that will work for you. That's my, that's my focus. What the Green Party does, what the Liberal Party does is their business. I'm focused on getting a majority of seats so that I can make the changes we've talked about today. Final question for you, and again, thank you for all of you watching on Periscope and Instagram and Facebook, and thank you to John for his time. What would you do differently to help with the fentanyl crisis that still continues yeah. um, and uh, decrease health care wait times? So those two questions that you asked, well, only two more is now six, and I'm good with that. No, uh, no I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm I went kidding. to three topics, I squeezed one three in. Three is two. John, we've done lots of questions over the day, time, and I think you should probably know that I try to squeeze in always yeah. at least one more, but, I, but, but it's for the people but, out there. Yeah, and, I, and I'm happy to answer both of <laughs> them because they're critically important. On, firstly, on the fentanyl crisis, a year ago, the BC Liberals said that we had a health crisis in British Columbia, and a year later, we're worse off than we were then. That speaks to a lack of, of ability to solve the problem. I think this isn't a partisan question. This is a provincial challenge, and we all have to work together. My solution in the short term is to dedicate one individual within my government, a minister responsible for mental health and addictions, whose responsibility it is to get up every day and focus on this crisis to make sure we're making lives better for people. There's a whole range of options there with uh, safe injection sites, and, and there's nothing that's not on the table as far as I'm concerned. We need to address this issue. A thousand people have died in the past 12 months. That's a thousand people too many. I've met uh, parents of, uh, that have lost a child as a result of this through the course of this election campaign, and I don't want to see any more parents, any more brothers and sisters who have to lose a loved one from a crisis that we can 
solved if we all work together. On the wait times, uh, wait, was it ERs or, or Yeah, so just said wait times generally, but yeah. you know, people were waiting surgeries, some yeah. cases more than three years. This guy in Asuyus, who was featured at the legislature, yeah, yeah. and then also people go into emergency rooms and wait. So you tell me what your well, plans are. The, the, the starting point is the urgent care centers that I, I spoke of earlier. We need to get people out of ERs so that they're not clogging wards so that we can do more surgery so that we can meet the needs of the growing wait times for, for um, uh, elective surgeries as well as urgent surgeries. Uh, and the challenge is that the more people that clog our acute care system, the more difficult it is to meet those challenges. So we've got to get people out of, of acute care and get them into places where they get the care they deserve. Home care means that fewer seniors are going to present in emergency rooms. If we have appropriate continuing and long-term care, that means that rather than transitioning from home care to a ward in a hospital, you're going to a place to get appropriate care. And the challenge I think that the Liberals have failed on in this regard is they're channeling people all into the acute care system because they're not keeping pace with these other methods. Urgent care facilities, better home care, and making sure that our continuing care is keeping pace with our aging society. Those are some of the solutions, and we're going to work as hard as we can to make those happen. Thanks for taking those polls. No, <laughs> no worries. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. This will be available on our Facebook page on YouTube for you to go back and you can share with your friends. You can watch this back. But thank you for all of uh, those who participated, sent in questions. Uh, we'll do a Facebook Live tomorrow with BC Liberal leader Christy Clark. Not sure on the time yet, so please check out our social media streams uh, when we get closer and we have that confirmed. But, John, thank, thank you. you so much for Appreciate doing it, this. Richard. Thank you. Audio's clear, I'm just take it for a second. Yeah, like I'm amazed with how many people tune in. Like, yeah. That's why we went oh, I know, they're huge. Oh, I, I'm just, I'm just, it's just, I've got two more questions. I'm just doing that for fun. That's yeah, no, I'm, I could, uh, yeah, you know, I'd stay here all day if, uh,